Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, pause this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here. Waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. In the context of this podcast, everybody refers to us and our cat. You are free to feel however you want about Rand, who is a fictional character. Don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Um, yeah, let's slam one out. We're running on election anxiety and cupcake fumes. That is correct. I've had a lot of sugar this week. Yeah, I made a whole ass cake yesterday that turned out, um, not quite as advertised, but still fine. Yeah, I think it's very tasty. Yeah, I think the taste is fine. As, um, Paul Hollywood would say, it looks a mess, (laughs) but it is, uh, tastes delicious. I don't even think it looks that messy, but... I understand your drive for baking perfection. Yeah, I think it's the perfect... I'm I'm not very, um... I don't consider myself much of a perfectionist, except when it comes to writing and baking. Mm. And even with writing, I have learned over, you know, the 15 years uh, that I've been doing it to, like, let things go and let them into the world, whatever. With baking, I'm still very protective when I make a make a snack. Well... It's very tasty. I really like the texture of it. Um, it's got a little crunch to it. It's called a bee sting cake. There's a German name for it that translates to bee sting, but mm. God help me if I can... Um... I mean, German is a fascinating language. <laughs> I went through a period of time where I was like, I'm going to learn German. This is when I still had like aspirations for academia, where I was like, I want to go to Germany and like study... Germany would be a, a really cool place to study. Yeah. So I was, when we were in New York, I did, like, a couple of months of German on Duolingo. Oh, you did? Yeah. That's fun and sexy. Yeah. And I've been thinking about doing it again. I also, I mean, if I'm going to learn any language, it should probably be Spanish. At this point, it's pretty embarrassing that I don't speak Spanish. So. Yeah, it's, like, a constant struggle for me that I, it's not a constant struggle for me. I'm just irritated at myself constantly for not choosing Spanish in Mm -hmm. um, high school, you know, in the American school system. I don't know how it is other places. You basically uh, can choose a language and most of the time you have to like take at least one year Mm -hmm. of one language and then uh, if you want to go on with that, especially if you want to be an English major, um, then you are supposed to go on with that. And I chose French because everyone told me that was the only teacher who actually taught the language, which, as far as I know, is true. Our French teacher was uh, an incredible woman and an incredible teacher, um, and I probably would have learned a lot if I were a better student. But I'm always like, I should have chosen Spanish because even though I would have learned less, like in the throughout my high school year, I still would then have the foundation now as an adult to like pick it back up a little bit. You know? Yeah. I had the same experience, but I was told to take French because the French teacher was, like, a lot nicer. Like, the Spanish oh. teacher had a reputation for, like, bullying her students and making them cry. Damn. Um, yeah, so I was like, I'm not going to do that. And the French teacher was very lovely. And I took, I mean, I took five years of French between middle school and high school and then two more years in college. So I took a lot of French. Do I know how to speak French? Absolutely not. No. I took the same amount of French. God bless Madame. Whose last name I literally cannot recall. Just Madame. Yeah, we all just knew her as Madame. Um, But anyway, yeah, I kick myself all the time for being like, why don't you choose Spanish? Because, yeah, then you would have, like, when you went as an adult to learn it, there would be a baseline for you instead of just, like, whatever. Anyway. One of the summers after I graduated high school, like, between... um, years of college I would go back and work at Chick-fil-A and one time my French teacher came in with her kids and was like oh my god when do you 
do you have a break soon? And I was like, yeah, I get my lunch break in like half an hour. And she was like, I'll wait for you. Aww. <laughs> and then she just let her children loose in the playground and um, ate Chick-fil-A with me. It was very weird and funny. That's nice. Because she, that just shows how nice she was because I was not a good student. And I like to imagine that I was, you know, friendly toward her. Yeah. Um, and not bad in the sense that I gave her trouble, but... What a lovely lady. She also carried twins for her sister. Like, as a surrogate. Listen, surrogates really are... I know. ...doing a lot. It's nuts. <laughs> ...out in the world for the people. Um, I mean, feasibly, the only person I would ever surrogate for would be one of my sisters, but, like, twins! Yeah. Twins! She was on bed rest for forever. Jeez. This is a scintillating opening just like last opening although at least this one has a narrative thread i deleted most of remember what we uh, talked about last week we sort of just rambled about how tired we were oh well that was true and what our apartment looks like last week was a rough one i deleted most (laughs) of it you guys will be happy to know has also been a rough one (laughs) this week has also been a rough one for entirely different reasons i would say i am at this is probably TMI, everybody, so I apologize. But it's winter in Utah. I mean, sort of. Um, and that just means that the air becomes, like, horrifically dry. Mm. And when you're going through a pandemic and hopefully washing your hands, the amount that you need to be washing your hands, your hands get really dried out. And I always have problems with my hands in the winter, but I'm having, like, full body issues with my skin right now, and I'm, like, not sure if it is actually that my skin is that dry or if it's like some weird new symptom of like what yeah. I am dealing with health wise and it's very upsetting and I was like getting like a red rash on my chest I don't know it might just be stress too my body might be like we've cycled through everything we need a new way to tell you to calm the fuck down and that's what my body does it's like are you feeling stressed would you like a rash in this trying time <laughs> Like, that sounds great. Um, sure, why not? I'm surprised my nosebleeds haven't started yet. Yeah. Ooh. You guys all know I get nosebleeds constantly during the winter, don't you? It's so fun. Um, by fun, I mean horrifying to everyone around me, including me. It's sad, though. Nosebleeds are sad. Nosebleeds are kind of fun. Like, there are people who are like, I've never had a nosebleed. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah, I've never had a nosebleed. Bruh. I don't know, it's just, like, not my body's it's such, particular. like, a human experience that I consider, but I guess that's, it's really just a me experience, and I'm trying to universalize it no, to I feel better about it. I think it's very common. Um, my friend Brianna's mom has a blood clotting disorder, like a blood platelet disorder, so her blood doesn't, like, clot very easily, and she gets nosebleeds, and they're so bad that she just has to, like, go sit in the bathtub until they stop. Damn. Because she, like, can't use enough tissues to, like, stop them up. Mine aren't that bad. So she just goes, like, lays in the bathtub, (laughs) which is horrifying, but, um, we are, are (laughs) unfortunately here to talk about Randolph Horror. So, welcome to Everybody Hates Rand, your friendly neighborhood wheelie time podcast. I'm... I almost said I'm Emily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sally Gudger. I'm Emily Jushaw. <laughs> so used to hearing your name. I know. So I'd be like, I'm Emily That's Jushaw. That's fine. That's why we're shaking things up. Season six. <laughs> You're the one who calls the shots now. Oops, I sorry, mean, that no. is a dangerous power to give me because I I just would talk forever about whatever. So Yeah, then that's what having a podcast is for, though. It's just, you know, have, give a mic to people who could talk forever about anything. But we do have a topic. And yeah. it's the Lord of Chaos. I mean, we could be my friend's sister-in-law who literally just started a podcast to talk about her life. What? Yeah. Is her life exciting or dramatic mm, at all? I mean, I wouldn't say that. She got married at 18 and had a whole podcast uh, about why she doesn't regret getting married at 18 and why people should stop bullying her for getting married at 18. Stop bullying me for getting married as a child. So. My child marriage is sacred. I mean, she did meet her husband when she was 16 and he was um, serving a mission in her dad's war. I mean, her ward. So. Like he was... Oh, he was literally serving a mission. He was a missionary in mm-hmm. their ward. Mm-hmm. 
Damn, Daniel. Yeah, and he would, like, come over to their house to, like, you know. Hang. Do missionary stuff. I'm par- and I am in- I am assured constantly that nothing happened between them. They didn't even consider dating one another until he returned from his mission. I mean, it would be pretty tough. I, like, missionaries, I can imagine if you're a missionary and you're, like, in Europe or whatever, you could kind of do whatever you want, theoretically, if you get, like, a chill enough companion. Mm -hmm. But in Utah, it's like, everyone's fucking Mormon, so if you see a missionary fucking around, they're gonna be like, 911 bishop? He was in Canada. Oh, this was in Canada. (laughs) Yeah, so she moved from Canada. Uh, okay. We don't need to get into this. 911 Bishop? <laughs> 911 Bishop, it's my new reality show. 801 Bi- does that even work? Yeah, Bishop is seven letters. 801 Bishop? 801 ah! Bishop. <laughs> Hello, this is your Bishop after dark. No! It's like a really. I bet there's like so much weird porn about Mormons. I 100% believe that there is too, because. It's like a concern, like I bet about missionaries specifically. Yeah, I don't want to think about it. I bet. Yeah, I just feel like they they hit that like everyone wants to corrupt them niche. Someone, not me, but someone who has a Pornhub sc- subscription or whatever, tell me if there's like a. You don't need a Pornhub subscription. <laughs> you don't. Are I'm you just googling <laughs> missionary no, porn? No, I'm just gonna go to Pornhub. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a fun new. <laughs> it's a fun new. Um, EHR thing. Porn. State of Utah warning. Exposing minors to obscene material may damage or negatively impact minors. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> what you see? Do you want to see the homepage? Um, oh, damn. <laughs> yeah. Just get right to it. Just sort of like, hey. Would you like to see this? Mormons. <laughs> Masturbating Mormons, bad Mormons, lesbian Mormons, teenage Mormons, fucking Mormons. No Mormon missionaries? Let's see. That Those are just the suggested categories. Oh, I guess the problem with Googling or Pornhubbing <laughs> missionaries is that you have so much, like, opportunity. Yeah. It's like a sex position, you know? Can you get missionaries doing missionary sex? You know? <laughs> Virgin Mormon teen Dolly Lee fucked during worthiness interview. <gasps> This is changing my life, but also it's probably not in a good way. <laughs> okay, we have to talk about Lord Chaos. We can't just scroll through Pornhub. <laughs> What's this stupid energy? <laughs> I hate this blighted hellscape. We've gotten several different of types year. of Mormon punishment rituals. Punishment rituals? Yeah, like you have you get caught doing something, and so you have to have like sex with your bishop or whatever. Oh, okay. Well, that's just like typical. Yeah, I mean role play with the added element. You're of right. It's your bishop, I you guess. You are totally right. I haven't seen anything about Mormons yet. Let's see. My bishop was my dad for a while, so <laughs> Pornhub would go crazy over that one. No. <laughs> we can't. You need to get off of Pornhub.com, <laughs> or you're gonna be there all day searching subgenres. You're so right. I would be okay. Okay, Lord of fucking chaos. Um, so we start with Rand practicing <laughs> swords. This is also a great scenario for a, a porno. Is Rand fighting five men? Oh, they their, all start fucking with their swords. Yeah, they're like something, something swords, something, something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fair. It's, yeah, it's all there. It's all there. Someone write the script. Especially once you zoom Ooh. out to the extremely erotic. Davram Bashir yeah, just with like, one leg slung over the arm. Yeah, chair. like holding a dagger. Like, Bashir is the only literary character I've come across who both has dad energy and has extremely, like, sexual energy in a way that interests, <laughs> intrigues me. Yeah, I get it. I get it. He's just, like, small and powerful. Yeah, I think it's the height. As everyone knows, Sally's into tall men. I'm into short men. I just think that... They're neat. <laughs> Short men. I think that they're neat. I just think they're neat. <laughs> I feel like they aren't as threatening to me personally. Mm-hmm. And I just I just think that the way they navigate the world is so different than tall men navigate the world. You know? Yeah, that's fair. That it, le- it leads to some characteristics that I typically find attractive. Um... But we don't need to psychoanalyze 
my sexual interests okay. right now. We've already been on Pornhub this episode. Um, we can get back on Pornhub and look at short men. Short men. How would they? Never mind. I don't want to know. Nope. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> anyway, Rand has this new thing where he is paying people to come fight him um, for, I would assume, an hour or two at a time, which... I think we have said this before, but for a guy who is governing three countries at this point, plus the ale, that seems like a an extraordinary amount of time to devote to sword fighting. Yeah, like every day. Yeah, when, as Bashir points out, he doesn't really need it. Yeah. Like, Rand, you know, fights these dudes. There's the whole uh, long monologue about the flowery sword forms or whatever. Is that what sword form? Are sword forms like in this world actually named in this way? Like, yeah, I think so. That's so interesting. I just thought it was a dumb thing Robert Jordan did when he's like, like as a writing quirk. Yeah, just as like a Robert Jordan talking about swords. Cause I honestly thought it was cause like Lan, who is um, Borderlander. Oh yeah, like, like taught it to coded. him as like yeah a cultural thing, and it was like coded in. No, we've seen other, um, I think we see other point of view characters who use the same, uh, like, flowery language. Like, Glad definitely does it. Um. But, like, if I were to meet a master swordsman yeah, out on they, the streets of Salt Lake City, would, would they it, all use the same? Would I be like, tell me about your sword forms? And would they be like, it's sunlight on? In Salt Lake City? No. <laughs> I mean, I know people are sword fighting. So, like, in... I meant, like, in this world is in, like, Uh, our world. Yeah, I think so. Planet I think there's two types of sword fighters in wheelie time. I think there's, like, the martial artist swordsmen who are, like, it is an art and it has forms. Mm -hmm. And there are the people who are, like, I just picked up a sharp object and I gotta whack other people with it to survive. Okay. That's how I feel. Like, I don't think your your random soldier, your random <laughs> infantrymen are going to be like, here's my heron fucks over the water <laughs> or whatever. Sunlight on the titty. Sunlight on the nipple. Mango. <laughs> Dribbling down. Mango. Your rack. Oh. Um, <laughs> I hate the phrase rack. I do too. It's not a great phrase for boobs. Um... <laughs> But I don't know. What do I know? Maybe that's, like, taught to people in kindergarten. Here are the sword forms. And Rand just didn't know them because there's no school. He's kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> He's functionally illiterate. No, that's Matt. Davron Bashir is like, what books has Matt read? And, and Rand's, Rand's like, like it. I'm sure he's read a book at some point. <laughs> Can Matt read? No. Question. Hmm? Anyway, Rand is being observed. He's in Andor. By a group of Andoran noble people who uh, represent, I believe, six of the 18 or 19 houses. This is going to be impossible to keep track of, but because we are a resource for you, I will do my best. Okay. Essentially what you need to know is that the people who are introduced in this scene, and I believe who will pretty much be with Rand throughout this book, are the same people who uh, Robin slash... What's his, what was his alias? Gabriel. Gabriel. Allowed to be near him throughout uh, Morgoth's captivity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they are the bad ones. Okay. They are not necessarily dark friends, although I think probably one or two of them are. But they are the ones who, once Rand is kind of out of the country and Elaine is trying to secure the throne for herself, they will, like, lead armies against her in an attempt to gain the throne for themselves. Okay. So these ones, they'll be impossible to keep track of, but unfortunately in the later books, they will come up a lot because Robert Jordan, for some reason, really wanted to make a big deal out of the war for succession with Elaine, which did not need to be a war. It just sort of happened because of how incompetent everyone is. But these guys are the bad ones, as also demonstrated by how gross and weird they are with Rand. They're just like... You're so great. Can we lick your boots? Will you make us queen or whatever? And Rand is like, fuck off. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Bashir is like, I'm going to throw a knife directly at you. Yeah. <laughs> Bashir's lounging. Mm-hmm. Again, it's extremely sexual. 
Um, he's like, why are you doing sword fighting? And Rand's like, because I want to. And Bashir, like, throws a knife at him. And Rand channels to stop it. And Bashir is like, you can do that every time. You, like, it's not necessarily the same with sword. You can't rely on swords to save your life. You gotta, like, hold your channeling. That's the real art that's gonna save your life. And Rand's like, I'm so angry at you momentarily. But Bashir's like, I'm very casual about the whole thing. Yeah. And Rand's like, all right, I'll chill out. It's a very yeah. odd interaction. It's a very... Bashir and Rand have a weird relationship. Yeah. Which I think, um... I don't know. Is dissected quite a bit in these two chapters. As, like, Tem is introduced. Tem. I don't know how to... We're gonna say his name. Mazram Tem. Yeah. Sounds to me. Um, as Tem is introduced and he is talking to Bashir and things and Rand has sort of like a little bit of a breakdown when Tem gives him one of the seals um and Bashir stops him and Rand is like you must have thought I was going crazy how are you so calm and Bashir's just like it'd be like that yeah well he tells a hilarious story about another salty in general who was batshit crazy (laughs) and like made them cut down oak trees and give them funerals yeah Amazing. <laughs> Bashir's like, once until you do that, I'm good. Yeah, Bashir's just like, listen, people be crazy. Yeah. You might be crazy, but I will deal with it because you are the dragon reborn. It's just, you don't really have much of an option here. Mm-hmm. You know? So he's really the only one taking, I think, the appropriate route. Yeah. When he's just like, it's chill. Like, he's not stupid about it. Yeah. He's fully aware that Rand might go insane and kill the people closest to him. He's just kind of like, that's sort of a risk you gotta take. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. And he's a military guy. I mean, he takes risks like that all the time. So, he's just so sensible very in that sexy way. sexy man, yeah. He's very sexy. He's also riding around, Rand tells us that all the Saldean, like, generals and most of their captains bring their wives campaigning with them, that this is a traditional thing. Obviously, Rand does not approve because he's a huge misogynist, but um, this is a cultural thing in many, many countries. Not in modern eras, really, but in ancient world, a lot of the times women went campaigning with uh, the men because military camps often don't really function when they're just left to men. Um, but it, it sounds like Bashir's wife, Dira, is like his second in command. I know. Because <laughs> he's like, if I die, she takes over the entire army. And Rand's like, what? Where? Oh, really? And he's like, yeah, and you don't want that, trust me. He's like, yeah. She's she, very mean. She will not like you. <laughs> so you can just, the whole agreement will be off. Yeah. <laughs> She'll be very pissed that I'm dead. Um, oh, hi, sir. Oh, hey, Tibble. Come to join us again? If you scratch my chair, I will throw you out the window. Tibble, you better not. You're going to be thrown out. You would do very poorly on the streets. Just like Oliver and company. Yeah. The artful dodger. Tibble is not the artful dodger. He is not. I'm... Tibble is the unartful dodger. <laughs> the fartful dodger. <laughs> That was the stupidest thing I've ever said. <laughs> so good. Um, Christ. Um, can't even remember it. There's just like, it's just like a long conversation, it feels like, these two yeah. chapters. And then one of Bashir's soldiers walks in and is like, um, Mazram Tem is here? Oh, wait, before that, um, Rand and Bashir are just talking and. Rand says something about like the forsaken. Oh yeah. And literally one of the Ander noble women just faints. Yeah. Dead away. Yeah. They're all just like the forsaken. And one of the forsaken <sighs> was ruling us. And Bashir's just like these wimps. Yeah. Babies. Babies. Eat the forsaken for breakfast. The forsaken are not scary and no one should be afraid of them. No, they're honestly just the <laughs> stupidest people. But they are talking and it is sort of revealed that Bashir and <clears throat> Matt have created this plan, presumably to attack Samuel and Ilian. That's kind of the context that we're given. Is Rain says something about getting Ilian from Samuel, and Bashir's like, well, with the plan we put together, it should fall really quickly. 
And this is what leads to him being like, what books has Matt read? Who has he studied under? Smart young lad. And Orion's just like, I can't, I I don't know. I don't know her. Yeah. He's like, also, you're wrong. Matt is very stupid. Also, Matt's the stupidest motherfucker alive. Very dumb. He tried to open fireworks once. Yeah. Very stupid. For some reason, good at war. But good at war. Don't worry. That's the one thing he's got going for him. Don't worry about it. Um... But this will sort of explain, like, why Matt is not in Rand's coterie anymore. Yeah. It would be very funny to watch Matt have the scene where Matt and Dev from Bashir are planning this siege. Yeah, it would have been nice. Finally, a military planning, like, moment that I would be interested yeah, in watching. Yeah, and Bashir's just, like, looking at him. Mostly I just want Bashir and Matt, like, interacting more. I, I feel really robbed of interactions that Matt might have had with, uh with military leaders who are already kind of stable in their positions. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't see him interact with Adelmar really until, you know, long after book two. Mm-hmm. I mean, book two is the only time they interact, as far as I know. Um, we All the interactions with Bashir pretty much happen off screen. Mm-hmm. He never talks to Gareth Brynn, God help him, until maybe the last battle. Um, who are the... Pedro Nile. And a two-year-old. A two-year-old, yeah. He also doesn't really talk to a two-year-old. I think a, two- a two-year-old was just name-dropped in the pa- chapter of Path of oh, Daggers that I read. He? Yeah. By well, Grendel, of all people. He might be um, in Path of Daggers. That might start. You'll love a two-year-old. He's just so delightful. I'm very excited. Also short. I just love him and Bashir. I feel like they could be in love. Yeah. They both love, I mean, they could both love their wives and still be in love. I feel like, yeah, they could both have open marriages and yeah. then they could, you know, be like, we're in love, our wives are in love with each other. Yeah, ethical non-monogamy is an option, kids. God, I think that would be beautiful. Don't forget it. Um, especially because Bashir gives off, like, really strong bisexual oh, energy. Yeah. It's the way he sits on a chair. <laughs> it's the way he sits on a chair, it's the way he throws knives at people. It's the way he, he's It's just... the way he loves his horses. Yeah. I just love him. Anyway, yeah, then one of Bashir's men comes in and is like, uh, Mazrum Tim is at the door. And Rand's like, mm. Could he not be? <laughs> Could he not be there? Bashir's like, I'll let him in and I'll murder him. <laughs> and Rand's like, no, he's probably here for the amnesty. And Bashir's just like, so who's amnesty? Amnesty, <laughs> amnesty uh, accounts for like war crimes and things yeah. like that. And Rand's like, yeah. Bashir's like, no. No, it don't work like that. You know, like, Rand's amnesty is fine and functioning for, like, w- it means literally we're not going to arrest you or send you to the authorities for the ability to channel. Yeah. But Mazarum Tem, known war criminal, yeah, fully could do that. Yeah, he, like, literally in this scene is just, like, talking about some people he had, you know, captured during a parlay yeah, or and, whatever. Yeah, uh, like, put... He, Sounds like he put them under compulsion, yeah. which is a big no-no and a big indicator to Rand if he was paying attention that this guy is bad. Yeah. And Bashir's just like, oh, I gotta kill him. Um, yeah. Tem enters the room greasily. <laughs> <laughs> he basically slithers in <laughs> like a slug, leaving a trail of slime <laughs> behind him. So terrible. Bone slip and slide. But uh, the first thing... Bashir says is your boss from Tim or something like that. Which again is fuel for the fire that is Robert Jordan trying to convince us that Mazrum Tim is Demondred in disguise. Mm-hmm. Um but it is not actually unrealistic to think that Mazrum Tem and Bashir never interacted closely face to face. They were on opposite ends of a battlefield. Mm-hmm. Um and I don't think Tem uh, Bashir was the one who necessarily, like, arrested mm-hmm. Mazarum Tem. I think that was Aes Sedai, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tem's like, uh, yeah, I shaved. What's something only you would know? Which is when he drops this info about some of Bashir's, uh, men and women, because their wives were also involved, who tried to kill Tem under, like, a flag of parley, which, you know, is a no-no, but... You can't really blame him. Yeah. This guy. Disgusting. And he, I guess, put them under severe compulsion and sent them back to Bashir. Basically, um, different people. Yeah. 
And Bashir tries to draw his sword and all the Saldean guards are like, ah, rah, rah, and are kind of like poking yeah. him with their swords just a little bit. Rand like has to grab Bashir to keep him from drawing his sword the whole way. Um, But he's like, you all need to calm down. War crimes? They happened in the past. And also his war crimes were not as big as the Forsaken's war crimes. Lesser of two evils? It's fine. We should always grant the lesser of two evils the capacity to teach men how to channel. <laughs> to teach men how to do those lesser of two evils. Yeah. It's fine. He basically, his whole argument is like, this is how bad the Forsaken are, so we've really got to stay like on task with murdering each and every one of them. Um, to ensure that the world does not fall. And if having Mazram Tem on my side to teach the men uh, who have come to me seeking amnesty will further that goal, then so be it. And again, this is like not logical because um, it's a little bit ridiculous to compare the crimes of the Forsaken to Mazram Tem. Like, there's a reason we don't say like, when someone is convicted of murder, well, you're not as bad as Ted Bundy was, so three to five years. Yeah. You know, we don't sentence people based on the crimes of other people. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Mazram Tim did bad things in his own right of his own volition. Mm -hmm. That makes him a bad person. What, is he a redeemable person? Well, I don't know. Perhaps he could have been. Who are we to say? But he is very clearly, in this scene and throughout the rest of the books, a bad and slimy person. He has no interest in. Mm -hmm. Like, Redemption. Rand's like, you just need to submit to me and we'll all be good. And Tim's like, I'd rather not do that. Why don't we have a partnership? And Rand's like, yeah. <laughs> challenging my power, mm -hmm. my manpower. My manpower. And Muslim Tim's like, no, sir, I will not challenge your manpower. I, y you are all submit. <laughs> Rand's like, what? Else? Rand's like, that was a quick turnaround. And Tim's like, I mean, I had to try to not be, you know, in a subservient position. But clearly that's not happening because you're crazy. And Rand's like, fair enough. Fair enough. Um... Around this point, Tim is like, I brought you a present, and gives Rand the, according to Rand's own accounting, seventh seal. Well, Rand says that there are three that he knows are broken, two that are whole and he has in his possession, this one is the third. Yeah, so the sixth. And he's like, I don't know about the seventh one. We know from the last book that Nynaeve actually had the seventh one and that it is broken. Mm. So four down, three to go, I guess, is the math. And I'm just like, I just brought this to you to just prove how devoted I am or whatever. And Rand's like, where'd you even get this? Tim's like, some randos on the side of the road. And Rand's like, sounds reasonable. <laughs> right? It's like, I stopped to get some water or some from a farmer. And a farmer was like, do you want this? What? <laughs> He's like, his family um, said that they'd been protecting it for generations. So they gave it to me because they thought I was the dragon reborn. And I'm like, I mean, if I, if a random man claiming to be the dragon reborn stopped at my house, I would not give him my most treasured possession. Until he'd done, like, some of the, the, you know, prophecies. Yeah, especially if he was greasy and disgusting especially and if he looked like full Tim. of his war crimes. Yeah. Poke him in his war crimes fall out. <laughs> <laughs> Just full of war crimes. I hate, he's, it's fine. Take a cookie cutter, war crime, war crimes shapes cookie, cookie cutter. You'd just be infinite cookies out of Mazram Tem. <laughs> war crime cookies. Infinite war crime cookies. Stupid. Um, this episode is dumb. I know. Uh, but they have like a brief conversation about the difference between them. Like Mazram Tem is basically like, I could have been the dragon reborn. No one would have known until I fulfilled one of the prophecies. Mm -hmm. And Rand's like, well, you definitely weren't born on Dragon Mount. Like... Wasn't that an indicator to you that you weren't? And he's like, mm, 
prophecies are kind of loosey goosey. If I had done a different prophecy, then people would have, you know, warped the past to uh, fit what is going on. And Rand, of course, has basically fit all the prophecies to a T, so that's not really been his experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is just like an ongoing submission into the uh, catalog of Robert Jordan fiddling with prophecies as a theme. Um, let's see. But having given Rand the seal, Rand has been struggling this entire time with Luz Thorin's voice in his head. He's hears it a lot, especially as the Forsaken come up, and he's pretty good at, like, compartmentalizing it. Mm-hmm. Just being like, I'm not listening to you right now. But Luz Thorin takes over a little bit when he gets a hold of the seal and is like, we gotta break it, we've gotta break them all. And Rand sort of comes back to himself, realizing that he is muttering. And Devon is like, holding his arms. Yeah, he's got the seal raised above his head. Remember, Rand is about six foot five. Yeah, and Devon is... Only goes up to Rand's shoulder, so... Yeah, Bashir is literally standing on his tiptoes. Yeah. Which, again, sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I find it sexy. Um, yeah, to, like, keep Rand from just breaking this. And he's like, I don't know what the... F-. He doesn't even know what it is. Yeah. He's like, I don't think you want to break that yet. And Rand's like, uh, you... You're correct, sir. I do not want to break this yet. Um... And then that's where they have their conversation about how Bashir is so casual about serving an insane person. <laughs> but Rand officially gives the seal to Bashir to keep safe, which is an interesting expression of trust that he doesn't really, like, dissect. Mm-hmm. He is not, like, explicitly in the text, like, I trust Bashir, even though everything we've seen indicates that he trusts Bashir. But for Rand, a person with such intense trust issues... And we are introduced to the theme of his inability to trust Aes Sedai. Um, also in these two chapters, because there used to be an Aes Sedai in Camelin, who I believe was one of Alita's spies, mm. um, that Gabriel found immediately and took over. That was sort of a, 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 a Z plot in Fires of Heaven. Um, she immediately fled. So now there are no Aes Sedai in the city. To heal Rand if he cracks his head open playing with swords is Bashir's point. But Rand's like, well, I might have all these rebel eyes that I who are going to help me. And Bashir's like, well, it's not really as good as, like, the actual White Tower. And Rand's like, it doesn't really matter. They're still eyes that I, and I still can't trust them, but I'll use them. Bashir's like, okay, fine. Bashir's like, I don't even care. I just want to, like, exit this conversation. Yeah, I'd like to leave. I've only been talking to you for 30 seconds, <laughs> and it's already as exhausting as it always is. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so Rand is like, here, take this seal to the Dark One's prison, and Bashir's like, sure. <laughs> um, and pretty much leaves. Rand's like, okay, we're gonna go to the farm. Mazarin Tim's like, what farm? And Bashir's like, I'll stay home. Thank you, though. Mm-hmm. Come see my horses do stunts later. And Rand's like, yeah, of course I will. See you, Dad. <laughs> Bye, Dad. Bye, Come Dad. Like, see your ponies. Welcome by. See the ponies doing tricks. <laughs> yeah, the horses are out there just doing sick flips. Yeah. And Tim's like, what well, farm? And Rand's like, this is the farm where I'm going to use you. And Mazer and Tim's like... <laughs> To pick weeds? What are you talking about? I was like, I don't love that phrase. I don't love the farm. The farm does have, like, ominous connotations. I'm gonna send you to the farm. I'm gonna send you to the farm. Where all the lesbians are gonna kick your ass. (laughs) I mean, that sounds amazing, actually. Yeah, sign me up. If, like, I got to watch a bunch of lesbians beat up Mazram Oh, I would allow a bunch of lesbians to (laughs) kick my ass. That's That's fair, too. No, you don't. (laughs) We all do, on some level. You know? Not me, I'm perfect, baby. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm a terrible garbage can and also need my ass kicked. <laughs> so do you tibble? Especially you tibble. But those are those two chapters. <laughs> um, It's a typical Wheel of Time opening. Not a lot is going on in the first um, few chapters. This is... Uh, let me think. The second book in a row that has opened with Rand essentially 
surrounded by advisors Mm -hmm. of some kind and pretty much ignoring them. He's still more or less struggling with the same things that he struggled with in book five. Um, The challenges of uh, who he trusts and how he's going to get the job done and how he's going to do it while staying sane. He finds it remarkable that Mazram Tem is apparently sane after he estimates 15 or so years probably channeling. Um, He says that it's been about two years for him, which again, this timeline is so wacky. I guess that makes it like three years between. Never mind. Um, but, uh, and he clearly is already starting to crack quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just sort of like where we're kicking off, I guess. Matt is off on some unknown alien related mission. Mm-hmm. Um, Rand is expecting, I guess, some sort of, like, indicator that the Rebel Aes Sedai are on his side. He has to deal with Tem, he has to deal with the farm, and he has to deal with Matt's secret mission to Ilian, which, do not worry, will be totally disrupted when Rand is like, could you actually escort my girlfriend home, or whatever? And Matt's like, I will literally kill you. And Matt's like, I have a certain set of skills. Yeah. And you're having me bodyguard a woman who does not want to be bodyguarded. In fact, she is actively running towards a cliff. Yeah. With, like, sharp spikes at the bottom. You're just gonna, like, waste this beautiful military brain guarding this dumb hoe? Yeah. And And Rand's like, like, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I absolutely do not want you to have a plot appropriate to your characterization. That would be silly. Robert Jordan has never heard of those. Um... Okay, I don't have anything further to add. I don't either, except that Rand's introduction in Path of Daggers is also him surrounded by a bunch of advisors that he's ignoring and then yells at, so... Which probably probably happens in A Crown of Swords. Oh no, in A Crown of Swords it's him on the battlefield. The Dumai's Wills battlefield. But I think he's also surrounded by advisors in that. That he's probably ignoring, so... It's just like... He doesn't need to be in this position for eight of the 14 books, you know? Something's gotta change, Robert. Something's gotta give. Ch-ch-ch-changes! Ch-ch-changes! Just gonna have to be a different man! Time won't change me! Okay. But I can't Let's sing the rest of the Shrek 2 soundtrack. Okay. No, never here. <laughs> I was trying to remember how accidentally in love by Cowboy. Accidentally Rose. in the. So she said, "What's the problem, problem baby? baby?" We're gonna be sued by so many people. What's this? Episode. Specifically, Shrek. <laughs> Shrek is gonna sue us. Okay, we have Shrek as a lawyer. I have to like eat before I speak to my friends. Oh yeah. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to Glenn and Mackenzie for our theme song. Please check us out on all of our social media, uh, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram. Check out our website, everybodyhatesrant.com. Um, check out our Patreon where there's lots of fun bonus content, um, including Emily's most recent presentation on Alexander the Great, um, which you can get at the $5 level. Um, and if you want to join us every Friday... Well, mostly every Friday at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Emily is playing video games on our Twitch stream. And, yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah, it was a really good run through. Very professional. Thank you. Do you have a sign-off? I mean, I think the fact that I looked at Pornhub on our podcast is a sign-off enough. <laughs> you should find a really weird subgenre okay. to, like, sign us off. Okay. It's just a weird um, porn title. Minecraft encounter with an Ender Woman. Minecraft encounter with a. <laughs> Can you see it with my dumb privacy? Oh, screen? an Ender Woman. How did he craft a dick in Minecraft? I get it. We can't. We can't keep doing this, Daniel. Okay, it's not like it's gonna keep searching. <laughs> Scam angels. Scam angels. This has been a really weird episode. Minecraft it's... encounters. Oh, explore. <laughs> no, I'd rather not. Thanks, Pornhub, for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> no, Pornhub is actually bad. No, actually, no one, go- no one do that.
Pay for your porn. Pay for your porn. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.